Um, today, we're a pleasure to interview Professor Mayan Goyal for the Link Online newsletter. Mayan Goyal is a professor in the Department of Radiology and Clinical Neuroscience at the University of Calgary. He also holds the Heart and Stroke Foundation uh, Chair in Stroke Research, and he is the Director of the Imaging and Endovascular Treatment at the Calgary Stroke Program. Dr. Goyal is one of the most important research of the stroke treatment. Dr. Dr. Goyal, very welcome here. Thank you very much. So in this edition of our newsletter, is dedicated to the MIVO treatment. And you are one of, one of the physicians that most study this subject. Furthermore, you are the PI of the escape MIVO. So I'd like to talk with you about the MIVO treatment. First question for you, Professor. Do you think that there is any difference between primary MIVO and secondary MIVO regarding the treatment indication? Well, of course, uh, there is going to be a difference. There are different kinds of secondary MIVO. Uh, broadly speaking, secondary MIVO, where, um, let us say, a patient was at an outside hospital, had a large vessel occlusion, gets intravenous TPA or TNK, and by the time it comes to your hospital, the clot has moved. That is one kind of secondary MIVO. The second kind of secondary MIVO is you were doing thrombectomy for a large vessel occlusion, and the process of thrombectomy, part of the clot broke up and went into a medium vessel occlusion. So there are two distinct kinds of MIVO. But either way, is one important thing about secondary MIVO is that generally speaking, they have worse presentation and worse outcome because parts of the brain get affected that are not related to the MIVO occlusion. That's one problem. The second problem that is there is that if suppose you are treating a large vessel occlusion and at that point in time, the patient is under general anesthesia, the clot breaks up and goes into a MIVO. You have no idea at that point in time how significant that, that medium vessel occlusion is. And then the third issue is that from the point of view of a randomized trial, it's kind of close to impossible in that situation to randomize the patient because the patient is asleep right in front of you. How do you practically randomize that situation? Oh, very nice. And another important point, Professor, how can we define amivo as, I don't know, anatomical criteria, clinical criteria, or the diameter of the vessel, or all of them? Yeah, in fact, you 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 hit the nail on the head. And in fact, we wrote this article probably now three, four years ago. It's it's all those criteria put together. So the way to think about it is that it's an M2, M3, A2, A3, P2, P3 occlusion, which is at least one millimeter in size. So is accessible to thrombectomy, so to speak. And at the same time, is producing substantial clinical deficit. And what do I mean by substantial clinical deficit? The way that we thought about it is either the NIH is five or higher, or if the NIH is lower than five, then the patient has disabling deficit. For example, last week I saw a patient with a complete aphasia, NIH of three, but clearly disabling deficit. Mm -hmm. So once to, so we need to check all this uh, criteria to uh, take this, this decision to treat and MIVO uh, occlusion. And another important point, Professor, when do you think we should to treat an MIVO occlusion? Always or never? Well, right now, I think we should be enrolling into a randomized trial, is such as escape MIVO, and there are multiple trials running across the world. And depending on where your geography is, um, we, we, my recommendation would be that we should, uh, we should um, tackle the problem, uh, get level one evidence. Um, also, it is possible that the efficacy of thrombolytic drugs is higher in MIVO than in large vessel occlusion. So we also need to answer the question, which are those MIVOs which will handle well with thrombolytics? So, so we are encouraging everyone to participate in, in one of the big trials that are running across the world so that we can collectively get that answer. Not to mention the fact that if we start treating outside of these trials, there's also the risk of that, that the worst patients goes into the trial and then we never find the true um, efficacy of thrombectomy in uh, MIVO. Okay, understood. And what do you think that it's uh, an accessible MIVO? There, there are some MIVO that is not accessible for us. Yeah, I think that is a very sort of, there's no way to precisely define it. I think it's very, when you see the CT angiogram or an MR angiogram, 
It is not that difficult to figure out which is not accessible. In theory, you could also have a large vessel occlusion that is not accessible because of severe tortuosity in the arch or in the carotid artery. So accessibility is a combination of factors. The other part that is there is our tools are continuously improving and we have a, we have a very dynamic industry which is coming up with new tools to solve this problem. So what was not accessible five years ago has now become accessible. So, so there is also this issue of that, uh, you know, things are continuing to improve and it also depends on how the evidence plays out. Uh, so I think um, um, right now, um, one thing that is there is we should always be thinking about that we don't want a substantial complication, especially in a MEVO patient where the NIH is relatively low. So what you don't want is patients presents with an NIH of five and you do something super aggressive and end up damaging the vessel um, in, and make the situation worse. So obviously it depends on your personal skill set, comfort level, what tools are available to you. And you told in the beginning that in some cases, the patient is in general anesthesia. How can we explain the deficit that be uh, explained by the MIV occlusion? Do you think that the perfusion image can help in this situation? Um, well, the biggest usefulness of perfusion imaging or multiphase CTA, what we do at our center, is I find from the point of view of detection of medium vessel occlusion. And M2, M3 occlusion is just much easier to detect on perfusion imaging or on multiphase CTA. I do not think it really helps much in telling you what part of the brain is dead versus not dead. And we've written extensively on that topic. So, so in the non-contrast CT, I still find if there is a clear wedge of hypodensity corresponding to the occlusion, then obviously it's probably non-salvageable grade. But I do think um, um, perfusion imaging and multiphase CT are great for detection of medium vessel occlusion. This is my next question. How to improve the detection of MEVO occlusion? So... Uh, with the mood phase CTAs, one of the critical points to improve this detection? Um, yeah, so, so, so one of the things we've been telling people is that we have to think about it, not just from the perspective of detection of MIVO at 2 p.m., but at 2 a.m. as well, moving forward. And not only detection at the big hospitals, but at a smaller hospital as well. So, and, and many industry partners, all the imaging companies are coming up with, with criteria. I do think from the point of view of automated detection, I do think detection of MEVO is much harder than it is for LVO, just because of variability of anatomy and size, et cetera. So I think the way that we're telling people is that uh, you do a multiphase CTA, and if there is a holdup of contrast in a certain tissue, that helps you. Or if you do CT perfusion, and in the MTT map, there is a wedge of tissue that is hypoperfused, that helps you to know that there is likely um, um, a MEVO occlusion. Um, we are also uh, working with this imaging company where they're converting multiphase CTA into hypoperfusion maps so that you can look at the map and say, okay, this is uh, where the MIVO occlusion is likely to be and then go look for it. Um, but at the same time, as with anything else in medicine, as people get more comfortable with it, with detection of MIVO, um, I'm sure there'll be other innovative solutions that will come forward. Understood. And do you think in the primary MIVO that is it possible to treat MIVO without general anesthesia? Yes, I think so. I think that depends on what your center um, um, practices. At our center, we treat a lot of MIVOs without general anesthesia. Um, we have anesthesia standby, but we don't give general anesthesia. And I've been to other centers where they're treating 100% of their LVOs under general anesthesia as well. So I think there is no fixed answer to that question. Obviously, you don't want to be sort of going into a vessel blindly without seeing if the patient is thrashing and moving around. So I do think it uh, you have to make it make a judgment call based on case by case situation. Okay, understood. And the last question, do you think that MIVO is the new LVO of 2023? Well, we wrote this article four or five years ago where we titled it MIVO, the next frontier. So I think it's the next frontier. I do think we need to know the results of these trials before we call it the, the LVO of 2023. So hopefully these trials start coming out with results by the end of next year, and then we can, we can use that terminology. Okay, understood. Professor Goyal, it was a pleasure to interview you for, you for the Link Online newsletter. Thank you very much for sharing with us your knowledge. And I look forward to see you soon. Have a very nice day, Professor. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much and all the best to the LINK committee and uh, Laurent and, and uh, Jacques and Vitor uh, for the upcoming LINK. Bye-bye.
Bye-bye. Thank you very much, Professor.